Hello and welcome once again to another Liege Verse Live. And today we've got a really exciting video, something I've been working on for quite some time, maybe too long. Uh, do y'all still remember uh, iceberg videos? No? Well, I made one. I'm making one right now. And I'm joined here on twitch.tv slash Captain Hard Luck, CPT Hard Luck, with uh, a bunch of people, uh, fans of Liege Matsumoto. And we're going to take this deep dive together. We're going to dive into the legacy of Liege Matsumoto. And right off the top, I want to warn everybody. Spoilers ahead, this is your final warning. If you don't want spoiled on the Liegeverse, this is your last chance to click off this video or click off this live stream. If you haven't kept up on decades and decades, about 50 years of Matsumoto manga and anime, you know, that you may need to get on that. But we're gonna go straight ahead fearlessly uh, until we're nothing but bones from spoilers, something like that. And here it is. The Liege vs. Iceberg. I've been crafting this for quite some time, and you'll see you'll, we're going to go all the way down to the deepest depths of Matsumoto's legacy and discover things that we've never discovered before. So Matsumoto had a long career. All right. He published his first work at 15 years old, and we're going to get into that. So uh, from the age of 15, he passed away, unfortunately, at 85. So what's that? 70 years of manga? That's insane, people. Um, and much of his work is still obscure to the USA. Uh, Star Blazers, for a long time, was the only complete successful uh, English localization. Uh, I, I would emphasize more the successful side, getting sort of uh, syndication on television, and, and that despite massive edits to the content. Matsumoto also in his interviews notoriously stretched the truth and a lot of storytellers do this. They'll give an answer one at one point and then 10, 20 years later, the, he gives a slightly different answer, maybe unveiling things to us like an onion over time. So in reality, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Even when we've plunged on the ocean floor and we're overturning rocks on the Japanese trench, on the Japan trench, there's still going to be unturned stones. So leave a comment. If you're in the live stream right now, go ahead and chat with things that you think I missed or things that I should know or add on to points that I'm already making here because I probably definitely missed something. So here we are at tier one. We're just a widow baby Mayu. Okay, we barely know anything. And uh, that's where we're at. We're at a very superfluous level here at tier one. And that's why we're starting out with things like the blue and green Arcadias. Now we have a blue Arcadia and a green Arcadia. Why is that? Well, in the 1978 space pirate Captain Harlock, we are premiered in animation form with the Arcadia and it is distinctively blue. And then we go uh, just a year later to Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie, and we have this big green Arcadia with uh, sort of a very long shape to it, put it that way. Why is this change here? Well, there might have been some disputes between rights ownership within Toei itself, between its TV anime and movie anime divisions. There seems to have been some sort of problem along the way that prompted this change. Now, a lot of people have strong feelings on either Arcadia. Let me know in the comments which one's your favorite. I'm a green boy myself. The Daft Punk collab, Interstellar 4 5. This music, anime, video, rock slash space opera was a collaboration between Daft Punk and Liege Matsumoto. Now, Matsumoto's contributions might have been a bit superfluous or, or superficial, rather. Uh, he did contribute some character designs, which did end up getting changed, but it's impossible to deny how important Matsumoto's works were to a childhood uh, Daft Punk growing up. We did an entire episode on the Free Arcadia podcast about this that I heavily recommend you go check out. Totoro is the Arcadia. Like I said, spoilers abound. But here we see that Totoro transfers his consciousness into the Arcadia itself across 
all of the expressions of the Arcadia. It happens in Space Pirate Captain Harlock. We get it fleshed out a bit more in Galaxy Express 3.9, and then probably its most acute representation in Endless Orbit SSX, which is the follow-up to the Arcadia of my youth uh, Captain Harlock origin movie. Basically, Totoro is meeting a very untimely end and decides that he wants to continue sailing the Sea of Stars with his best friend, Captain Harlock. So he does put his consciousness into the central computer of the Arcadia, and Harlock actually permits Totoro a good deal of autonomy in all of these series, uh, the Arcadia often moving on its own. It's got a bit of a ghost ship vibe to it, if you haven't noticed. Maytel and Emeraldus are sisters. Now, this is maybe hinted at in the Galaxy Express 3.9 movie, but it's really officially confirmed in Maytel Legend, a short two-episode OVA, where we see crystal clear that Maytel and Emeraldus grow up together, and it's further solidified as time goes on. Even in Queen Melania, we see a sister character to the main character there that is very reminiscent of Emeraldus, maybe another seedling of this concept. Now, these two seem to identify uh, different energies, basically, a yin and a yang, Maytel being more royal and less active, and Emeraldus being uh, more of a tomboy figure and more of a rebel who wouldn't fit in a royal structure. The conductor's body, or lack thereof, like I said, spoilers, at the end of a do Galaxy Express 3.9, we find out that the conductor, who's basically just this uh, black head, not a black face, a black head with glowing eyes, uh, is just a gas entity, he opens up his uh, conductor's uniform and reveals that he's completely see-through. What does this mean? I don't know. Mikun. Mikun is the feline character that inhabits every cat character in the Liegeverse and all of Matsumoto's representations of little kitty cats. And it turns out that Mikun is named after Matsumoto's own cat, or cats as it were. Now, Mikun was Matsumoto's first cat, and during the production of Space Battleship Yamato, Mikun fell ill and did pass away during its production. Matsumoto recounts, noticing at a point that the cat was starting to become sick and promised to take it to a vet in a couple days. Well, there weren't a couple days left and possibly the intense production schedule of Space Battleship Yamato prevented him from being able to properly care for the cat. Though in these instances, uh, it is believed that Mikun passed away of cancer that there might not have been much Matsumoto could have done in 1970. Japan. Uh, apparently, according to legend, Matsumoto, during the episode of Space Battleship Yamato, where Dr. Sato says goodbye to his cat, Mikun, Liji Matsumoto takes his speakers during this episode's original broadcast, points them out the window towards Mikun's grave, and basically blasts that as a send off to his good friend. Now, like I said, there were multiple generations of Mikun and all having sort of the same look to them as well. Maytel's body, and what a body it is, much more substantial than the conductor's body. You may notice here that under the x-ray, it seems like any kind of flesh and bone human body, but we do find out it is far from this, at least in Galaxy Express 3.9, where we find out that Maytel also goes through the mechanization process, but in a way that allows her to inhabit cloned organic bodies. And this organic body, is apparently the body of Tetsuro's mother, at least in Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie. A uh, bit awkward when you realize what happens at the end of that movie, but there's some uh, implications there. Let's not get into it. Let's move on. And move on, we shall, to tier two. We're getting deeper now, and we've grown up from a baby Mayu to a baby Tetsuro, basically. He's a little older. I think he's... Uh, 11 or something like that in Galaxy Express 3.9, the anime series. So we're growing up, we're getting a little wiser, but not too much. Force 5, created by Jim Terry, where he took five different anime properties and localized them all for limited distribution in the US and Canada. And more specifically, translated, Dangard Ace and Space Kateers is what he called it, but it's actually Star Zinger in Japan, which is a adaptation of Journey to the West, uh, Dan Guard Ace being Matsumoto's only super robot show. And let's talk a little bit more about super robots, shall we? With Shogun Warriors, which also adapted Mazinger. But we're 
focusing on Dan Gardace. Now, Shogun Warriors was the creation of Stan Lee, a much more notable figure than Jim Terry uh, under Marvel. And basically, they created a, a completely original comic book featuring all of these different super robots from Japan. And this comic book was essentially a mechanism to get kids to buy these rather large and impressive for the time super robot toys. Uh, not a very faithful localization of Dan Gardais, but it is nice to know Dan Gardais got two cracks at trying to make it successful in the U.S. Unfortunately, Shogun Warriors was not a smash success, but Stan Lee would continue his relationship with Matsumoto through the years, as we'll find out. Maytel or Mater? Mater? I hardly know her. What's that? I mean, what's that mean? Well, Mater is actually Latin for mother. And again, like I said, uh, the reference of her body being Tetsuro's mother's. Yeah, she's a mommy and she's a growing learning mommy, learning how to take care of her little boy Tetsuro. Now, Mater was the original intent of Liege Matsumoto in the series, but... We find out in his last major uh, released and published interview that Matsumoto was aware that it was being translated in some areas as Maytel. Why was it being translated as Maytel and not Maytur? Well, in the romanization process of the English language into Japanese, there aren't enough syllables in Japanese to account for all the American syllables. So R and L are both represented by the syllable RU in Japanese. Hopefully I kind of pronounced that right. And so when you're working from Japanese to English, translators got to pick one or the other. And if they're not familiar with the Latin, they may have picked Maytel. And Maytel has a certain air to it. French maybe? Well, yes, exactly. And Matsumoto basically dug that it sounded kind of French and it was a completely original word. So there you go. It's Maytel officially now. The number nine. Now, we have many nines in the Liegeverse. Galaxy Express 39, Submarine Super 99, Fire Force DNA Sites 999.9, .9, or maybe it's 39.9. .9. However you say it, there's a lot of nines here. What is up with all the nines? Well, there's this implication of nine being a sort of end of the road, whether it be in life or in a circumstance, and being on the cusp of a new circumstance, a new life. And the Galaxy Express 39 is a bit of a ghost train. And that makes even more sense when you compare it to the train from Night on the Galactic Express, or Night on the Galactic Railway, which did help to inspire Galaxy Express 39, which is widely speculated to be about some kids meeting an untimely end and going on to the next life. So, and Tetsuro in Galaxy Express 39, intending to end his human life in favor of a mechanized body. Queen Melania is Queen Prometheum. Now, if you're familiar with Queen Melania, this isn't a big spoiler to you. But if you're not familiar, maybe if you're only slightly familiar with Queen Melania and you are more familiar with Queen Prometheum, this might be a big shock to you. And here we see in the slide the transition from Yayaoi Yuki, Queen Melania, or as she's called in Queen Melania by fellow La Metallians, her alien brethren, Queen Prometheum. She's known as Prometheum on La Metal. And in the middle, we see her undergoing uh, sort of mechanical chicken pox. And this is part of the mechanization process that she goes through in Maytel Legend, which I brought up earlier that establishes Maytel and Emeraldus as sisters. And that turns her into Queen Prometheum fully. And that's how we know her in Galaxy Express 39 as a completely mechanized figure. It's a very tragic turn of events for Yayaoi Yuki. She does not weather the aging process well. And she, in fact, fears it greatly, maybe becoming the all-consuming mother by what we know of Queen Prometheum in Galaxy Express 39, where her intent is to mechanize all life. Maytel's different colored coats. Now, you're probably familiar more so with the uh, Maytel on the right, the black fur coat Maytel, but uh, she has other expressions throughout the Liegeverse anime. Now, this may be because those other expressions weren't produced by Toei Animation. 
Maytel in white is Maytel legend. Maytel in red is Space Symphony Maytel. And Maytel in blue is Cosmo Warrior Zero. And these all seem to have uh, deeper implications. In Maytel legend, this is our, we see her as a child, and this is a very innocent Maytel, white, uh, pure. And then in Space Symphony Maytel, she might have a bit of blood on her hands. She's gotten more involved with the royal family of the La Maytalians, and she's had to make some critical decisions that have left some people unalived. In Cosmo Warrior Zero, we're seeing her in a very depressed, very moody blue state, a very depressed state. And she is reeling from the impact of her actions after her decisions lead to the invasion of Earth. Then we move on finally to Maytel in Black, a sort of widowed Maytel, a mourning Maytel. She's lost something along the way and she's maybe unsure how to move on from there. Maybe someday we'll see Maytel in a fur coat color that represents something more akin to acceptance. Matsumoto cameos. Leiji Matsumoto had a habit of sticking himself in his animes, and we see a few different examples here. Uh, the biggest one, Leiji Matsumoto crying into his beer, listening to a very sad song in Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie. Then we see him post being trampled by a Lumidos in Arcadia of My Youth. We move on to Cosmo Warrior Zero, where he's quite happy in the corner there. We actually see him in Cosmo Warrior Zero Gaiden, and he's illustrating some of his own manga there, very fourth wall break. And then the bottom right one you might not be familiar with, that's Leiji Matsumoto in Jerome Alkier's Memories of the Arcadia. This is actually part of volume two. This hasn't even come out yet in the States. We're hoping a blaze does that. Hey, Rich, I'm talking to you. We've grown up once again. We've gone from little boy Tetsuro to slightly larger boy Tetsuro, but still kind of diminutive. But he's looking He's about 16 in Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie. They aged him up a bit, so you've aged up with him. We're going down, but we're growing up. Toki no wa, the ring of time. This is very imperative when we're talking about things like the number nine, right? We're talking about cycles. And the ring of time is basically how Matsumoto was able to reuse different character designs, different concepts, and explain it in universe. A lot of people watch uh, Leiji Matsumoto properties and feel confused. Well, why is Harlock like this and this one? And why does the story overlap here and it doesn't line up? Well, I'm assuming you haven't watched our chronological explanation of the Liegeverse on the YouTube channel. Hey, I recommend you check that one out too. The Ring of Time was originally established in Mirazer Bond, which we have not received in America. It has been localized in Italy, so hopefully that'll make it easier for it to get over to us at some point. And basically, this is sort of riffing on Asuma Tezuka's star system, where Asuma Tezuka would also reuse character designs. You gotta remember, these guys were pumping out a ton of manga. They were in huge demand, and they didn't wanna produce less, because they had to spend more time on character design. So the way Tezuka describes it, a star system, well, it's kind of a reference to science fiction, but in all actuality, he means it more like movie stars that are being used in different productions. Well, Matsumoto reclaims the sci-fi element there with the Ring of Time. And basically, these are all parallel universes happening simultaneously, repeating over and over. It's a bit woo woo for sure, but it makes sense in the context of the Liegeverse. And it's actually expressed a couple times in animation. Uh, originally, we see Teresa there who exists outside of time, basically in space battleship Yamato. And that's why she's able to know so much uh, and inform the crew, the Yamato and the Garmalas of their destinies. And then at the end of the OVA for Galaxy Railways, letters from the abandoned planet, I believe, or the letter from an abandoned planet, something like that, uh, we see uh, Shura Destiny, Shula Destiny, uh, the owner of the Galaxy Railways, essentially, sort of messing with time and space and uh, making everything okay in the end. It's a bit of a trip, basically, that we see there. And the Ring of Time is definitely a trip. Uh, you gotta remember in the 70s, there was a lot of mushrooms floating around Japan. Spoilers. Illegal Captain Harlock Comics. And it's ironic here because we're seeing pirated comic book intellectual property for a space pirate property. Does that make sense? Well, here, let me explain. 
Eternity Comics, which was under Malibu Comics, produced their own Space Pirate Captain Harlock manga. Malibu Comics thought they got the rights to do just that, to adapt the Captain Harlock story in comic book form. Well, if you've seen our interview with Tim Eldred, he brings this up because he worked on this comic book, along with Ben Dunn and many others. And in that interview, he describes how they basically received a cease and desist, he says, either from Toei or Akita Shoten. Now, I believe it was Akita Shoten because they control Leiji Matsumoto's manga in Japan. And oddly, they were allowed to finish their comic book. They were allowed to complete their expression. That doesn't seem like a very Toei decision if you know much about how Toei handles intellectual property, especially on YouTube. Please don't, please don't demonetize me. Just kidding, I'm not even monetized. Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, pardon this blurry image. There's, It's not really possible to get a great image from the actual video that I'm going to discuss here. It's in very low resolution. But you may remember I discussed the Daft Punk collaboration they did, Interstellar 4 5, at the top of the video. Well, I think Brian May or somebody from Queen got a hold of this idea and thought to themselves, hey, we'd love to do something for the anniversary of Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen's most popular song, arguably. The people at Liege Sha, Liege Matsumoto's production company, said, hey, why not? Let's do it. And we've got just the thing to do it with. Liege Matsumoto had a lot more control over this one, and he was able to do it with his manga, Out of Galaxy Koshika. And so this is the only anime representation of that manga work that he did. Now, another interesting note about Out of Galaxy Koshika is that it was released as a manga on the Wii. You might be wondering, how is it to read manga on the Wii? It's not very good. It's not very good. Harlock in Space Battleship Yamato. What you're seeing here is concept artwork of space pirate Captain Harlock as he would have been represented in Space Battleship Yamato. Now, unfortunately, the original run of Space Battleship Yamato was cursed by low ratings, possibly because it was going up against Heidi Girl of the Alps, a definite juggernaut in anime. And they ultimately had to cut down the series run about by half. This left a lot on the cutting room floor and Harlock was unfortunately cut as well. Harlock did make it into some Space Battleship Yamato content. There were two mangas made by it, at least. Uh, one by Akira Hio, which does have Captain Harlock in it, represented as he's represented here, much like this concept artwork. But Leiji Matsumoto also did a manga for Space Battleship Yamato, and also shows Captain Harlock in his manga, but his representation is quite different. He's basically covered in a black cloak, a uh, black tarp more like, uh, with a big skull on it. And the lore behind Harlock in Space Battleship Yamato is that he's been affected by radiation. At the beginning of the series, you see that Susumu's brother Manubu dies, it seems. Uh, well, that changes in what we ultimately get in Space Battleship Yamato. But originally, he was supposed to be this character who had a bunch of radiated pirates basically on a ship that were fighting in the universe against the Garmalas. Well, maybe that would explain the black cloak, but maybe also Leiji Matsumoto knew that Harlock wasn't going to make it into the Space Battleship Yamato anime and decided to obscure the character's design further to keep that in his back pocket. Because, of course, we know a few years later we get Space Pirate Captain Harlock, the manga, and then the anime. If he had been in the anime Space Battleship Yamato, we might not have gotten those later Toei produced intellectual properties. So... Uh, for better or worse, Harlock was cut from the anime Space Battleship Yamato. Marianne of My Youth. Here we see Marianne Hold, who starred in Marianne of My Youth, conveniently enough. This was a Franco-Germanic film released in France and Germany in both languages, which was common at the time. I believe it was filmed twice. Leiji Matsumoto sees this film when it's localized for Japanese audiences and basically falls in love with this woman. Now, there are many other women we could have talked about in this iceberg, but we're going to focus on Marianne Hold as the predominant expression that Matsumoto follows for his ideal woman, uh, as we see it represented through characters like Maytel. And you might also notice that Marianne of My Youth sounds a lot like another Matsumoto film, 
Arcadia of my youth, which is, like I said, the origin film of Captain Harlock. There are a lot of similarities between these two movies, especially when a Harlock from World War II starts to talk about his family's estate, which is a castle in a wooded, hilly area, which is basically the setting of Marianne of my youth. So definite references being made there. It's also of note that My Youth in Arcadia is not the appropriate translation specifically for this reason, though it was originally released that way. The train ride to Tokyo at the tender age of 18, Leiji Matsumoto decides to begin his manga career and take a train ride overnight to Tokyo. And this is a very legendary experience for the manga master. He takes this train and he goes through the Landmon Tunnel, which connects different islands of Japan. And this is an underwater tunnel. He recounts the exhaust of the train, basically filling up the train cars and smelling the exhaust and coming out on the other side of this tunnel into what I believe is mainland Japan. And everything seemed different. The building, the architecture was different. Uh, but even the ocean seemed different. And I believe it's nighttime at this point where he looks up at the stars and imagines himself taking this train basically through space. I can't imagine that Japan, the countryside, was very well lit at this time. And so you can see here the inkling for the idea of Galaxy Express 39, which he would pen many years later. He was also greeted quite well on this train ride. He was given a free meal by a couple and offered a cup of sake by another train passenger, which he allegedly tossed out the window quite politely as he'd never tasted sake before, maybe a bit of uh, cold feet on his first buzz. We're going down again and we're growing up again. We're now the conductor from Galaxy Express 39. We're kind of keeping it together. We kind of know what's going on. But if you've seen either of those series, we don't really know what's going on yet. Steven Universe. Now, Steven Universe has a lot of references to old anime in it. And these ones referencing Matsumoto are quite distinct. We have uh, Blue Diamond, who is, seems to be a quite obvious reference to more particularly Lamime uh, with their blue skin and long hair, but also a reference to Maytel because they tend to cry a lot. Then we have Lars, who is in one of his episodes, a captain of a spaceship seemingly, and he's got to get up quite like space pirate Captain Harlocks. Akira Matsumoto. Who's that? His brother? No, that's Leiji Matsumoto's original name. That's the name he was given at birth. Now, he felt that name was a bit too common. And when he married his wife, Miyako Maki, who we might talk about later, he decided to make a big change and turn into Leiji Matsumoto. We'll discuss that in a bit as well. The Nishizaki feud. Now, this is a bit of bad blood and it gets a little messy here. Yoshinobu Nishizaki was the producer of Space Battleship Yamato. Where does his experience in anime come from? Well, it seems he was always just a producer, handling money, and not necessarily handling money in the best way. Before Space Battleship Yamato, it's alleged that he embezzled money from productions of Asuma Tezuka, the god of manga himself, and creator of anime in many ways. So, how did he end up getting all the money to do Space Battleship Yamato? Well, that's a different video for another day. But he ended up going ahead with this general idea. It wasn't called the Yamato at first, but eventually he reaches production hell. He's losing money and he realized he needs a real visionary. He's just not cut out to lead this kind of effort. And he approaches a young and burgeoning Leiji Matsumoto, who's starting to really establish himself. He's had his big breakout manga, uh, Otako Oiden, and he's starting to get more involved in the sci-fi world. Well, Matsumoto had a lot of reservations about this, primarily that he wouldn't have complete creative control over the property, but some destiny might have led him to uh, want to work on this. And we're going to talk about those little bits of destiny later. Regardless, this feud sort of grew out of uh, contentious, uh, visionary conflict. Matsumoto at one point, seeing that Nishizaki wanted the main character in red, but his friend in green. Now in Japanese content, you usually pair the red with the blue, the red oni with the blue oni, the fire with the water. Makes sense, right? Why would you want it to be green? Matsumoto asked Nishizaki, are you colorblind? Yikes. Now, Nishizaki works on more Space Battleship Yamato content, but along the way, he ends up getting arrested for 
ownership of guns and methamphetamines. It's a bad look, especially in Japan. And this kind of ends up making Matsumoto the default uh, believed creator of a lot of Space Battleship Yamato, or at least he gets a lot of the props that a said creator would get. Now, even though it's originally Nishizaki's idea, Leiji Matsumoto kind of basically rewrote the entire story. And Matsumoto may feel that he has a lot of rights to this story. Well, he goes on trying to relaunch his own Yamato stories, Great Yamato, Yamato Zero. And this ends up getting him in a lot of hot water and Nishizaki basically sues in the early 2000s over this. And eventually we decide that, the Japanese courts decide that Matsumoto really only owns the Yamato design in manga form. It's a very odd decision and one that I don't think would be made in American copyright courts, but it does make some sense to give him some sort of consolation for his work. Yoshinobu Nishizaki would pass away. He had a heart attack on a boat in 2010 and basically fell off to his death. A very dramatic ending for a very complicated man. Inspiring Star Wars. Now this is contentious for a lot of people who are big fans of Star Wars and are aware of things like Space Battleship Yamato and Captain Harlock. But here I have a few examples of how Leiji Matsumoto has inspired Star Wars. And I believe those inspirations start at the core development of Star Wars. Here we see on the left-hand side, Keiyuki standing next to a female figure with a costume much like Keiyuki's. In fact, it's also referencing a bit of Captain Harlock there with a the double belt. Well, this female character is the original protagonist of Star Wars. That's right, Luke Skywalker was not the intended original protagonist. It was originally intended to be a female character. Why they made that change later on, who knows? Maybe the studio felt more comfortable selling uh, male-dominated sci-fi genre works to males with a male lead character. Regardless, uh, there seems to be a bit of inspiration there. But the more obvious comparison here can be made between analyzing and R2-D2. It's hard to look at Analyzer, which came out several years before Space Battleship Yamato, and not think of R2-D2. And it's not to say that even Lucas himself was inspired by Leiji Matsumoto on this account. We know a lot about the production of Star Wars and the creation of the models that they used in shooting the spaceship scenes for Star Wars. Well, those models were created in large part using pieces from sci-fi kits or at least sci-fi toys originally created in Japan. They were shipping over a ton of Japanese content into California to make this series. And it's quite possible that somewhere along the line, somebody gets their hands on an analyzer and knows they need to make a little robot friend for Luke Skywalker. And and this is the result. Now, a little fun thing we have here is a comic book adaptation of Star Wars featuring Lando Calrissian and what can only be described as Captain Harlock garb. This is a bit after the fact, but a definite nod to Leiji Matsumoto from Star Wars creators. Shoujo career. Matsumoto gets off the train, lands in Tokyo, and immediately he's able to find work most easily in shoujo. Now, this was the 1960s, the early 1960s, and shoujo was actually booming at the time. The female manga reading market was exploding in Japan, and there was a lot of opportunity there, so Matsumoto decided to take on whatever he could get. And he learns a lot about women at this time. He even says he didn't know what underwear women wore when he started making shoujo anime. He didn't seem to understand anything about women, and he kind of liked to lean into drawing animals and those kinds of stories. But you'll see here a few definite expressions of women in shoujo manga. The first one on the left is Natasha, who could have probably been her own mark on the Leiji verse iceberg. Very definitely inspiring, uh, may tell in many ways, and inspired by a movie, Dr. Zivago, with the main character there. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, Maria the Silver Valley, and on the right, we have Blue Petals. These are all shoujo manga that were created by, at the time, Akira Matsumoto. Japan's Three Animation Maniacs. This is the title given to the trio of Asuma Tezuka, Shitaro Ishinomori, and Leiji Matsumoto as they were coming up together in the world of anime and manga. Now that time was very exciting for a lot of different creators, but these three bonded very definitely and would watch a lot of different movies and anime together, which we will talk about here in a second. They did believe themselves to be the biggest animation maniacs in Japan. 
Now we're growing up even more from the conductor who doesn't seem to know what's going on but wants to be in control. Now we're Kei Yuki, the expert navigator of the Arcadia in space pirate Captain Harlock. We've still got a bit to grow, but we definitely kind of know what's going on at this point. Dr. Sirio Nishioka. Now, here we see a couple cr uh, credit for Dr. Sirio Nishioka in Cosmo Warrior Zero, for which he does the series setting. And then we also see in manga form, Dr. Sirio Nishioka, who appears in the Eternity arc, what is now called uh, of Galaxy Express 39, this revival in the 90s that Galaxy Express manga gets. And why is that revived? Well, it might well be because of Dr. Sirio Nishioka, who is a close friend of Leiji Matsumoto. Now, this is probably probably a pseudonym, probably protecting their identity. But this person leads a lot of efforts to bring back uh, Lazyverse properties in the early 2000s. And we see here Cosmo Warrior Zero, which has a fantastic story, if nothing else, that blends a lot of different disparate elements of the Liegeverse and expresses them all in one beautiful uh, movement that fits in with the Liegeverse completely. He is the sort of the leader of a planet in the Galaxy Express 39 Eternity arc. Lika-chan, why are we looking at Barbie dolls all of a sudden? Funny you ask that. Miko Maki, who is Liegei Matsumoto's wife, was a legendary shoujo manga creator in her own right. And it might have been a good thing that Akira Matsumoto at the time chose to work on shoujo manga because it led him to knowing Miyako Maki on a very deep level, level, biblical even. And Miyako Maki probably sees Barbie and decides that Japan needs their own equivalent. So she takes her iconic shoujo character designs and applies them to these dolls. And this doll is now the Barbie equivalent in Japan. It was a huge moneymaker and still is a huge moneymaker for Miyako Maki and might have had a lot to do with why she stopped making so much shoujo manga. Dr. Slump Queen Melania crossover. Now this was apparently lost media of some sort or adjacent to that. I know lost media is becoming a very contentious word, but it was recently uploaded to the internet. And now we have access to this episode of Dr. Slump, which is a Akira Toriyama joint that features the main characters, Yao Yuki and Hajime Amamori, definitely didn't have to just look that up right now, who join in the Dr. Slump fun, which is a very slapstick, funny fantasy manga. And I think they might have noticed that Dr. Slump was not having a slump and Queen Melania, the anime series, was having a slump and definitely needed a big boost. So we see the old Akira moving on to the new Akira and these are both Toei animation joints. And basically this is a bit of a passing of the torch, however sad that might be for Liegeverse fans. Um, but. There you go. Warrior Zero is Faust. Now, this is a bit of speculation, but there's a lot of strong evidence for it. Warrior Zero, the main character of Cosmo Warrior Zero, and Faust from A Do Galaxy Express have a lot in common. They both have a locket, which they love quite dearly. In Cosmo Warrior Zero, we notice that that locket has a picture of his past child and wife who he loses during a great war. Now, Faust has a final drink before his conflict with Tetsuro at the end of A Do Galaxy Express 39, where he shares a drink with Captain Harlock, and they seem to have battled together in some sort of war. Well, in Cosmo Warrior Zero, the same is true of Warrior Zero and Harlock, who both fought against the Machine Man army. So there seem to be a lot of strong links here, and perhaps at some point in some spin of the Tokinoa Ring of Time, Warrior Zero loses his way and becomes Faust, and is actually the father of Tetsuro Hoshino, which would make sense why Harlock seems so apt to defend this young boy. Lieji meaning. Now, earlier we found out that Akira Matsumoto is Lieji Matsumoto's original name, and he changed his name to Lieji when he got married to Miyako Maki, needing to make a big change in his life. Now, Lieji has a few different meanings, and we'll see in a lot of different uh, names in the Lieji verse that they are rife with meaning. Re or Le, like we talked about earlier, those interchangeable syllables, Le, Re, means zero. 
And it may be a reference to the A6M Mitsubishi plane that was flown primarily by Japanese soldiers in World War II. So we're definitely referencing this plane a bit. We're also saying the infinite warrior, G meaning a man or a warrior, it seems. And this infinite warrior or the zero man, somebody with infinite potential, a man who's willing to go to battle for what he believes in and is yet unmade and has infinite potential. Now, Back in the day, I translated Liege on Google Translate, and take this for what you will, uh, it came up with illustrative. Now, that would make a lot of sense, right? We see him right there in that picture illustrating. This was slightly confirmed by my friend Darren John Ashmore, who you can find videos of on this channel, who said that the kanji did kind of look like illustrative in one way or another, drawing or uh, something like that. So there we have basically three different meanings, his love for mechanical playing, his love for the infinite potential of young men, and a little nod to the fact that he's a manga artist. The Spider and the Tulip. This was a very formative animation in Japan, a Japan-created animation that was seen by Japanese children all over the country. And apparently, though, it was seen at the exact same time by Akira Matsumoto, later Leiji Matsumoto, and Asuma Tezuka. They allegedly saw the exact same screening of The Spider and the Tulip, and this motion picture had a lot of impact on both creators. Susumu Matsumoto. Am I talking about the main character of Space Battleship Yamato? Yes and no. Susumu Matsumoto is actually the name of Lieji Matsumoto's little brother. Now, these two grew up together and they both have a strong love for aerospace engineering. And Matsumoto turned down the ability to go to college to do that. He had that right, but he went and became a manga artist instead because of all the encouragement he got being a young manga artist. We'll talk more about that in a second. So Susumu goes and becomes an aerospace engineer, which is quite incredible. And it turns out that Matsumoto would constantly run ideas by the more educated uh, Susumu to make sure that his spaceships, which look extremely fantastical, could actually work in real life, theoretically. And allegedly, Matsumoto did design something that Susumu put into something that was launched into space. And basically, we have Liezu Matsumoto signed designs in space in some way, shape, or another. Here we see Susumu giving his final lecture and talking about his relationship with his brother. He apparently worked a lot on lubricants. Tier 6. We're growing up from Keiyuki to Lamime, and she knows quite a bit about Captain Harlock and the Liege verse. Maybe not everything, but dang close to it. She's very close to Harlock. Stan Lee and Gene Roddenberry collaboration. Now, you'll remember I talked about Stan Lee earlier on in the video regarding Shogun Warriors. Well, after the death of Gene Roddenberry, he apparently had some scripts, and one of those scripts, Stan Lee and Liege Matsumoto were supposed to work on. Apparently, during this visit that we're seeing a photo from, uh, they intended to speak with one another and work on that project. Now, this never came to fruition, though it might have been for the best. If you know anything about Gene Roddenberry, Stan Lee, and Liege Matsumoto, they have very differing views on the world. So we might not have gotten a very cohesive product if the Stan Lee and Liege Matsumoto had worked on something by Gene Roddenberry. Matsumoto's father in World War II, we see him circled in this photo. And actually, he was a air pilot in World War II, and he was literally trained by French pilots. Now, this kind of bit the French in the butt later as uh, Europe was uh, industrializing Japan and uh, America maybe too. And if you know anything about World War II, you may know that Japan's uh, lust for more power in this industrialized world kind of did pour fuel on the fire, pun intended. Now, Matsumoto's father flew one of the few remaining aircraft uh, that Japan had access to during the Yamato's final and first and final launch, uh, the Yamato being a giant battleship created by Japan. It was intended to be unsinkable, but as we know later, it was sunk, and Matsumoto's father felt the impact of that explosion from 30,000 feet above the Yamato itself. And now, Matsumoto's father would never fly again after this for any sort of effort, uh, military or just commercial. Matsumoto saw this not so much as a resignation uh, to his abilities as a pilot, but to sort of a stick to of his values and a deep regret, an expression of deep regret for all the men
men that Matsumoto's father had to send to his their deaths during the Second World War. Anthropomorphic. Did I spell that right? Anthropomorphic bugs. Now, y'all familiar with furries, right? And maybe Nico cat girls at that. I don't think they're furries, but let's move on from furries because these are buggies. Well, Matsumoto had a deep fascination with bugs, it seems, as many mangaka did. Uh, bugs, bug catching being an old pastime in Japan for children, uh, possibly during World War II, it was done for purposes of eating. But Matsumoto's love for these bugs definitely comes out when he expresses these uh, beautiful sort of butterfly or dragonfly women. Giant Rock Yamato. Now, this is another symptom of Yoshinobu Nishizaki and his original ideas for what became Space Battleship Yamato. I believe it was originally called the Icarus here. And this the idea was it was sort of an asteroid or piece of terrain that's turned into a ship and flies uh, to fight the Garmalos or something like that. Well, this idea is maybe kind of a little stupid, maybe a little hard to sell uh, Space Battleship toys of a giant rock with a uh, blaster coming out the backside. Thankfully, we all know that Matsumoto came on board and redesigned this completely to look like the Yamato. Erotic manga, ooh, sexy time. Lazy Matsumoto made a lot of sexy manga in the 60s and 70s. In fact, his erotic output might only be contested by Go Nagai, who had quite a bit of his own sexy manga. Uh, though Matsumoto's renditions are often just more playful, a lot of shadows, a lot of rolling around in the sheets, uh, and generally with these tall, beautiful women and the more potato-headed young men uh, that we see this uh, bit of a juxtaposition going on. Maybe an expression of how he felt about his own self-image and the beautiful women that he uh, had an attraction towards. Honey Bee's Adventures. At the young age of 15, Leiji Matsumoto submits to a contest by Manga Shonen Magazine, Honey Bee's Adventure, and actually wins. This is his first officially published manga work in a major publication. And it led to all sorts of opportunities. Asuma Tezuka himself sees Honey Bee's Adventures and reaches out to Matsumoto, looking for him to come on board as an assistant. Now, Tezuka refers to this as a of an apprenticeship, but Matsumoto saw it more like contracted work and denies that there was ever a real apprenticeship under Tezuka. We're here at level seven and we're no longer Lamime, we're Totoro. Like we said earlier, Totoro is the Arcadia, so everybody's on board the Arcadia and we're all on board for this iceberg still, right? You're still watching, right? Totoro's cool. West Side Story Manga. Now, Matsumoto did a few larger American IP in manga format. He did one called Laramie as well. Uh, but West Side Story is a bit of an odd one, in my opinion. It doesn't really fit a lot of the themes that Matsumoto would take on later. And it's also interesting to adapt a musical, which has sound in it as its primary driver, into manga format. But here we see him illustrating some of these manga boys dancing, these West Side Story characters dancing throughout his manga. Not much more to say about it, but an interesting footnote. Black Market Animation. Remember we were talking about Black Market Comics earlier? Well, uh, there was a run-in with the law at a point. Japan's top three animation maniacs, Tezuka, Ishinomori, and Matsumoto, were getting together quite often and having these, what might have been growing into large watch parties, and what might have been Black Market Cinema, or at least Black Market Film. Uh, the sale of a lot of different film was uh, Black Market, and it was definitely Black Market to have these cinemas for profit, and they were eventually approached by the police. Well, thankfully, by this time, Asuma Tezuka had a bit of pull, people knew who he was, and he was able to smooth things over with the, with the police. They weren't charging for this, they were just having watch parties, and it was just to grow the knowledge and educate everybody in this anime and manga burgeoning scene. Thankfully, the cops looked the other way, and these guys got to keep studying great film and cinema and animation. 
The Arcadia was always green, psych! Remember when I said there was a blue and a green Arcadia? Well, I don't know why it was ever blue. Rintaro makes this decision as Space Pirate Captain Harlock's director to make the Arcadia blue. It makes no sense. The blue Arcadia is constantly being lost in the blue backgrounds of space in Space Battleship Yamato. And you gotta remember at the time, Japanese viewers were watching these on pretty low resolution TV screens. It couldn't have been easy to decipher what the Arcadia looked like. It makes almost no sense to me. But here we see in an illustrated manga panel, a colored manga panel, that the Arcadia was always green, y'all. It was always green the whole time. Did I just blow your mind? Sister's car accident. Now, we're going to sort of tone things down here a little bit. This is a bit of tragedy in Liezu Matsumoto's life, where he loses his sister to a car accident, basically calling the death a death of poverty. There was a procedure that could have saved his sister's life, but at the time it happened, Matsumoto did not have the riches that he acquired later on in life, and he was actually unable to get to see his sister in time. She passed away before he was able to get to her. So it's a bit of a tragedy in Matsumoto's life. And we may see this as a recurring theme. You know, he grew up around the tragedy of World War II. He sees his sister pass away, or at least hears about it. And he may have this struggle throughout his life with death, maybe feeling like death is chasing him. But maybe that's why he develops the concept of Tokinowa, this repetition of time, and why he lives by this mantra of time does not betray dreams. And I believe this was true of even Matsumoto's life. Even if there were things that he didn't want to do, his dreams were fulfilled and will continue to be fulfilled by the people who love and respect his works. The Roy Fokker Captain Harlock connection. And what we have in between them is Shin, uh, the main character of Area 88, which was created by Keoru Shitani. I think I said that right. And Keoru Shintani was the apprentice of Liyeji Matsumoto. You can see a strong similarity between Captain Harlock and his fighter pilot gear in World War II as Shin has in Area 88. And Roy Fokker is in Macross. Now Macross, during its original development, was a parody and parodying a lot of different popular anime and manga series at the time. It's not hard to see the similarities between Roy Fokker and Shin. So there you have it. The ancestral DNA of Captain Harlock directly impacting Macross and Roy Fokker. The Toshiba mascot manga. Now here we'll see a little Astro Boy ripoff. That's Lightspeed Esper. And he was the mascot of Toshiba. And this mascot was adapted into a manga and a Takusatsu series. Now the manga starts off with an original artist, but that artist eventually leaves the project. There's still demand for Lightspeed Esper manga. And so Leiji Matsumoto, looking for a way to get deeper into sci-fi manga, takes on the job on the condition of being able to do whatever he wants with it. Well, well, one of the things he wants to do is totally change what the character design looks like. You remember that he was a good friend of Asuma Tezuka and probably didn't want to draw another uh, Asuma Tezuka ripoff character design. And his original design, you might have noticed in his shoujo manga career, looked a lot like Asuma Tezuka's already. Well, Matsumoto needed to make a shift and Lightspeed Esper is exactly how he does it. You'll see on the right side a much lankier, longer character, and that's a style much more akin to what we know in modern day of what the Liegeverse looks like. And here we are in the deepest depths of the Liegeverse iceberg. You've done it. You are now Captain Harlock. This guy knows what's going on. Mushrooms. Remember when I brought them up before? Well, they have a bit of a sordid past in the Liegeverse, predominantly in the Tatami trilogy series that peaks in popularity with Otako Oiden, or I Am A Man, or what we're seeing a couple manga panels from here, or covers as well. Now, Otako Oiden is kind of the story of Matsumoto's early life, young adulthood in Japan. As part of the legend, Matsumoto had so many dirty pairs of underwear just sitting around in his apartment that they eventually started to grow mushrooms all their own. Apparently a lot of spores floating around in the air in Japan at this time in the hot, balmy weather and the sweat maybe nourishing uh, these mushrooms that grow on his boxers that 
Apparently, we see here Otako Oiden himself eating said uh, underwear mushrooms. Well, apparently Matsumoto fed these mushrooms to a friend, maybe a friend that he didn't like very much, I guess. And what we see here on the right is another expression of Otako Oiden on these boxes. What's in these boxes? Jock itch cream. Young boys and their mushrooms. Let's move on. My eye! Now, this is a bit of speculation on my end, but I did stumble across something interesting in the dub of Arcadia of My Youth, where during the scene where Captain Harlock loses his eye and gains his eye patch, there's a part of the scene where he goes, Aah! Well, when you play that backwards, it sounds a lot like this. Now, to me, that sounds a lot like he's saying my eye. And maybe the sound designers at this point thought, eh, it's a bit on the nose. If you were sh shot in the eye, would you really scream my eye? You'd probably just go, Ugh! So they do a bit of audio magic and flip the audio and uh, it turns into a bit of uh, Paula's dead, if you know that reference. Alcoholic Maytel. Now, this isn't Maytel. This is Shizuko. And Shizuko is featured in the Drifting Express 3.0. Sound like any other manga or anime you're familiar with? Right. Galaxy Express 3.9. Well, Matsumoto had this habit of taking his ideas and replicating them amongst different variations and some variations being more serious, some being more comedic. And this one is basically a comedic variation on Galaxy Express 3.9, where we have Shizuko, who's sort of a clone of Maytel, uh, starts off as an educator, but she's a bit of a lush, has a taste for alcohol. And in this series, she drinks quite a bit of it. And apparently has a whole rack of it on her arm there. I don't know a ton about this series because it's not super available in English, but I do know that people love the concept of Maytel being a beer drinking lush. Endless Odyssey Disown. This is another very contentious one and another bizarre decision by Rintaro here. Uh, Endless Odyssey or Captain Harlock, Endless Odyssey, Outside Legend is called an Outside Legend very specifically. And I believe that was uh, the request of Leiji Matsumoto himself. At one point during production, it's found out that the new, who are the antagonists in this series, are embodied by a symbol, and that symbol looks a lot like a Star of David. Now, this got out to the public somehow, probably fairly unfortunately, and there's a lot of potentially anti-Semitic implications here. Now, you could also say that the Star of David is a lot like the Key of Solomon and maybe referencing something else, but when you realize that new sort of rhymes with another word, yeah, it doesn't look good. Matsumoto especially uh, noticing how problematic this is. Uh, his own knowledge of World War II, quite specifically, he decides that this has to change and there is no uh, Star of David in what we ultimately see in Endless Odyssey. But Matsumoto was very sure to disown this expression of Harlock, even though a lot of people really like Endless Odyssey. Rintaro, what were you thinking? Yamato Blueprints. Now, during the time Matsumoto was in his apartment building filled with mushrooms and dirty underwear, he apparently had a neighbor, and this neighbor had something very special, classified blueprints for the Yamato. Now, the image I have posted here is a bit of an artistic representation. I don't know if these were the actual blueprints he got, but it's something that really spoke to Leiji Matsumoto, a deepening connection to the Yamato itself. And this might have been part of the reason why, on top of his father flying over the Yamato when it exploded, why Matsumoto eventually takes on the space battleship Yamato anime. The Gazelle. Now we're at the deepest, dankest parts of the Leijiverse iceberg. Uh, after the creation of space battleship Yamato, Leiji Matsumoto goes on a safari. And part of that safari in Africa is to go on a hunting trip. Now, in an interview with An America, now defunct anime magazine, the interviewer asked about Leiji Matsumoto basically busting a cap on a gazelle. And it seems like a bit of a, an attempt to gotcha moment Leiji Matsumoto by this interviewer, maybe not done in the best faith, but Matsumoto does regret having pulled the trigger. He feels a deep 
uh, maybe a shame after he pulls the trigger on that gazelle. He does bring it home as a trophy, uh, but he says after that, he never fired a gun on a living thing ever again. He saved his uh, shots for empty cans in the backyard. So that's it. That's it for now, at least. Thanks for watching. I'm sure that given another few years, I'll dig up enough stuff to do even another iceberg. And maybe with all the comments you guys leave in the YouTube video, I'll be able to put these together and we'll go down to the dankest depths once again to discover more about what I at least consider my favorite anime and mangaka master, Leiji Matsumoto. You can always check us out for near daily post on Facebook at facebook.com slash liaisyverse, or you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash USA. We are quickly becoming the world's largest Liaji Matsumoto fan project, but we are currently the largest English speaking one. So if you speak this language and you want to learn all you can about Liaji Matsumoto, I urge you to follow us over there. Thanks again. I'll see you out there in the endless sea of stars.